Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Tena koto, tena koto, tena koto, katoa. Good morning, everyone. A warm welcome to St. Peter's Cathedral. Welcome to this service of Holy Communion as we gather together this morning in this cathedral church to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We give thanks despite the darkness and the sadness of Good Friday. Life, after all, proved to be stronger than death and love stronger than hate. Praise God. So welcome, welcome our regulars, welcome our visitors, welcome to us all in the name of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to God's house of prayer on this Easter Sunday. It's a joy to have with us this morning Archbishop David, our preacher, our celebrant. Welcome to him, Tenakwe, and welcome to members of his family. Good to see you all on the front row. With a sense of sadness today, as his last formal visit as Archbishop to his cathedral. No my, hari my, God makes us all welcome in his house of prayer today. Seats are bringing brought in from the cathedral centre, so if you haven't a seat yet, don't be too concerned, a seat is on its way. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. We sing our opening hymn, Jesus Christ is risen today.
I runga i te ingoa o te atua te matua te tama me te wairu a tapu. Amen. In the name of God, creator, redeemer, and giver of life. Amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Happy are those whose sins are forgiven, whose wrongs are pardoned. I will confess my sins to the Lord. I will not conceal my wrongdoings. God forgives and heals us. We need your healing, merciful God. Give us true repentance. Some sins are plain to us. Some escape us. Some we cannot face. Forgive us. Set us free to hear your word to us. Set us free to serve you. God forgives you. Forgive others. Forgive yourself. Through Christ, God has put away your sin. Approach your God in peace. God of glory, fill your church with the power that flows from Christ's resurrection, so that in the midst of this sinful world, it may signal the beginning of a renewed humanity, raised to new life with Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to sit down for the reading from Isaiah.
A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear, and he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Anyone is welcome to stand and join in the singing of our Easter anthems. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced. 
how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Paschal Lamb, Christ, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the festival. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out, and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came 
following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, If you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabunai, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the Gospel of Christ. In the name of God, creating, redeeming, and life-giving. Amen. A bishop was visiting a vicar on Easter Sunday morning for a wonderful service like this one. And uh, the whole week before, there had been some nervousness about the Bishop's arrival and the standard of the singing, which today I must say is exemplary, and the flowers and the brass and uh, the behavior of the servers and so on. And everything went off perfectly until at the end of the service, the bishop was out by the door there and the young daughter of the vicar happened to be left alone with him for a few minutes while the vicar was unexpectedly distracted. And to fill in the time, the bishop said to the young vicar's daughter, the vicar's young daughter, "Um, was there anything about this Easter service you didn't understand? And she said, no, no, I understood. And then to fill in the time, he said, well, was there anything about my sermon that you didn't understand? And she said, no, no, I understood your sermon. And uh, then she said, she piped up and she said, but there was something my daddy said just now that he didn't understand and the bishop said oh what was that my dear and she said well he just said he didn't understand how you got to be a bishop (laughs) 
I mention that for two reasons. One is that it's traditional to tell a joke at the beginning of an Easter sermon. This has gone on for over a thousand years. Why? Because joy, because laughter breaks the power of the shadows. It was said in medieval times that the devil flees with holy laughter. The power of Christ's resurrection is a victory over the negativity of the shadows and despair. So jokes were told. I've just resurrected that particular custom this morning. I think the dean mentioned it in his letter to you this morning as well. Secondly, though, I mention it for another reason, and that is because my own little daughter, who's here this morning, uh, was baptized the day after I became a bishop in this cathedral 20 years ago in that font. The first thing I did after being seated as the Bishop of Waikato in that chair over there 20 years ago uh, was to, on the Sunday morning, walk down this aisle and baptize Awatea in that font. I was wearing exactly the same chasuble that day. And uh, so it is, it is for that reason that I mention that story as well. It's been 20 years of love and joy, challenge, crisis, opportunity, of resurrection living, being part of an Easter community, of an Easter faith here in this cathedral, year in and year out, all down through those years. What is Easter living? What is Easter faith? What is Easter community made up of in particular? Let me explore three things that mean a lot to me. Living in the power of Christ's victory over sin and death. Living in resurrection. First of all, I think it means doing what the New Testament does, what the Gospels do with crucifixion. The terrible details of Christ's capture and trial and torture and death are recorded in extraordinary detail. They occupy the largest part of all of the stories of the Gospels. Why? Because they have to share what is on their hearts about this tragedy. Because they have to pour out their grief and their angst and their sorrow. And they write it down. A tradition all through the Bible, from the Book of Lamentation through the Psalms, and everywhere else. The Bible is not afraid of saying it how it is, of facing pain or loss or crucifixion with full honesty and writing it down in detail. Surely that would make you feel worse. Surely you should put that behind you, have a cup of tea and move on. The Bible doesn't do that. The Bible encourages you, as the stories of the cross tell us, to say it how you feel it, and to say it in the company of trusted friends, to share the text with others. Why? Because even though you encounter the trauma as you write it down, something happens when you share it. Something happens when you pour it out. Something is released by way of catharsis in you. You shouldn't be afraid of it. God can surround the pain and the death with compassion. It may be the very way you move beyond it by saying it how it is. So Easter living, Easter community, Easter faith is by being honest about your pain and documenting what you feel in trusted company. The New Testament does. Secondly, on the road to Emmaus, which was the first resurrection experience of two of Jesus' disciples, probably a man and his wife, a man and a woman, a woman and a man, probably, we think, walking along, having quite a powerful domestic about why the whole mission had failed. It says in the narrative on the road to Emmaus that they were debating between themselves. They were in intense dialogue. Their eyes were cast down. They were depressed. They were locked into a defeat. 
They were certainly not energizing each other. They were both feeling more and more downcast. But they had been honest about what they were feeling. And in the process of walking the 11K from Jerusalem to Emmaus, the village of Motza as it is now, something happens in the process of walking and talking and being joined by something else, something bigger than them, a presence, a mind, a spirit, a body who joins their bodies and walks along that road, asking them to say what it means, asking them about what they're sharing. And in the process of that prayerful conversation, when it's all done and dusted, when they've poured it all out, when the questions have been asked and the responses have been given, and that third person stays with them on the journey, at the end of the day, they don't want to lose the company and suggest he come in to join them for an evening meal. And then, at table with them, as we're about to do, and the only reason we're going to do it, he takes bread and blesses it and breaks it and gives thanks. And in that action they recognize God in Christ, risen between them and in the midst of them and in that meal which we're about to do the first Eucharist on that road to Emmaus they give thanks and they are transformed they enter the Easter meal the Easter community the Easter faith of the risen Jesus and they rise up and walk from that place the next day different people about to make a different world in the risen power of Christ. Three actions. Telling it how it is, being honest, pouring out your pain or your grief, documenting it even. Secondly, walking, talking, praying, opening your heart to be joined by a presence which is greater than you who doesn't wipe away your pain in an instant, but interrogates it, listens to it, works with it, walks even though you're downcast beside you. And then at the end of it, inviting that presence to be present in a meal, to give thanks, to be taken above your natural sorrow, the psychologist Jung once said that of all our pains and all our burdens and all our sorrows, none of them are completely resolved by us where all the ends are tied off and everything's neatly packaged up. What usually happens in healing or redemption or transformation is that a, eventually another power, some other cause, some other experience lifts us up and beyond, having worked it through a greater power than us picks us up. And that's why we come here this morning. A greater power to rise up and walk with. That's why the pattern of crucifixion and resurrection is written in all of creation and in all the cosmos and in all our lives. The simple pattern of moving beyond death to life, moving beyond pain to the healing graces, moving beyond despair to hope. The Irish poet somewhat sentimentally put it like this. I see his blood upon the rose, and in the stars the glory of his eyes. His body gleams amid eternal snows. His tears fall from the skies. I see his face in every flower. The thunder and the singing of the birds are but his voice. And carven by his power, rocks are his written words. All pathways by his feet are worn. His strong heart stirs the ever-beating sea. His crown of thorns is twined with every thorn. His cross is every tree. You can trust Easter faith and the movement from crucifixion to resurrection in your own life, in your own community. 
in your own despair and in your own hope. You can trust this principle, this spirit, this truth. Make Eucharist here and know what that feels like. And in the end, in the end, it makes a huge difference in the nitty-gritty of our lives. Let me leave you with this thought which has accompanied me for the last 20 years in this remarkable faith community which my family and I will continue to be part of one way or another, even though I'm partly living in Rome. In the face of your biggest challenges, in the face of your heaviest burdens, think on this. In the power of the resurrection, facing life, people can sometimes be unreasonable, irrational or self-censored, but resurrection power enables you to forgive any way. Sometimes if you're kind, people may accuse you of being selfish or having ulterior motives. In the resurrection, you can be kind anyway. You may be successful and may win some unfaithful friends and some genuine enemies. In the power of the resurrection, succeed anyway. If you are honest and sincere, sometimes people may deceive you. In the power of the resurrection, be honest and sincere anyway. What you spend years creating might be destroyed overnight sometimes, but create anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, some may be jealous of that, but be happy anyway. The good you do today might be forgotten. In the power of the resurrection, do good anyway. Give the best you have, and it may never be enough, but give your best anyway. In the final analysis, it is between you and God in Christ. May we live and move in the power of his resurrection. May this Easter community, this Easter faith, go on to a sunrise of hope. Amen. We stand to affirm our faith together. Let us affirm our faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God on true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified and is spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world, giving thanks for God's goodness. Blessed are you, Lord our God. 
On the first Easter day, you raised your son, Jesus Christ, triumphant over death, sin, and evil. In his death, you have destroyed death, and in his rising to life, you have opened to us the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. With the whole church throughout the world and in heaven, we rejoice, for Christ is risen. Let every Christian rejoice. Let every heart rejoice, for Christ is risen. We ask your blessing this day on all who are celebrating the resurrection. We pray especially for groups that are persecuted or oppressed because of their faith. Those who are not able to come to openly worship without fear as we do. We remember also all who doubt the good news and all who are seekers. Jesus, stand among us in your risen power. We remember today all who are struggling with life. We pray for the world's poor, refugees, and all who are used as work slaves. We continue to raise to you Syria, Palestine, Afghanistan, the Congo, and all places not featured in our news broadcasts, but who struggle to survive and feed their children and keep them safe. We ask your blessing upon all who are losing heart or who feel discouraged and despondent. Jesus, stand among us in your risen power. Today we especially pray for our Archbishop David and his family as they prepare for David's departure to Rome. We ask that you will bless him in this new ministry to which you call him. And we ask that you take care of his family in New Zealand. Thank you for his ministry among us. We give thanks for those who taught us the faith and introduced us to the living Lord. We just take a few moments of silence to remember personally those who have encouraged and walked with us in our faith journey. We pray for schools and Sunday schools for all teachers of religious education. We ask you to bless us with your presence in our homes and in our work. Jesus, stand among us in your risen power. We pray for all who are terminally ill, for all who are in a hospice or in care. We pray also for their loved ones in this time of anxiety. We remember those who have been bereaved this year, especially all who are left on their own and feel lonely or unable to cope. Lord, bless all whose powers are failing with your love and strength. Jesus, stand among us in your risen power. We rejoice in your triumph over death and we pray for all your saints and our loved ones who have departed this life. May they rejoice with us this Easter day in the fullness of life eternal. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen.
To you, Lord, belongs the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. All that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours, and of your own we give you. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, through your goodness we have this bread to offer, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, through your goodness we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become for us the cup of salvation. Blessed be God forever. The Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right indeed, it is our joy and our salvation. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, at all times and in all places, to give you thanks and praise through Christ, your only Son. You are the source of all life and goodness. Through your eternal word you have created all things from the beginning and formed us in your own image. Male and female, you created us. When we sinned and turned away, you called us back to yourself and gave your Son to share our human nature. By his death on the cross, he made the one perfect sacrifice for the sin of the world and freed us from the bondage of sin. You raised him to life, triumphant over death. You exalted him in glory. In him you have made us a holy people by sending upon us your holy and life-giving spirit. But chiefly are we bound to praise you because you raised him gloriously from the dead. For he is the true Passover lamb who was offered for us and has taken away the sins of the world. By his death, he has destroyed death. By his rising to life again, he has restored to us everlasting life. Therefore, with the faithful who rest in him, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying,
All glory and thanksgiving to you, Holy Father. On the night before he died, your son, Jesus Christ, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he took the cup. When he had given you thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, to remember me. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Your death we show forth. Your resurrection we proclaim. Your coming we await. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, therefore loving God, recalling your great goodness to us in Christ, his suffering and death, his resurrection and ascension and looking for his coming and glory. We celebrate our redemption with this bread of life and this cup of salvation. Accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving which we offer through Jesus Christ, our great high priest. Send your Holy Spirit that these gifts of bread and wine which we receive may be to us the body and blood of Christ and that we, filled with the Spirit's grace and power, may be renewed for the service of your kingdom. United in Christ with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, O God, in songs of everlasting praise, blessing, honor, and glory be yours, here and everywhere, now and forever. Amen. As Christ teaches us, we pray. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We, who are many, are one body, for we all share the one bread.
presence with you. May the Lord bless you, protect you and guide you this day and all your days. Body of Christ given for you. 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 Draw near and receive the body and blood of our Saviour Jesus Christ in remembrance that he died for us. Let us feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Everyone is welcome at this table. If it's not your preference or custom to receive the bread and wine, feel free to come forward. Place your right hand on your shoulder for a blessing. post-communion prayer, let us pray. God of life, who for our redemption gave your only begotten Son to the death of the cross, and by his glorious resurrection has delivered us from the power of our enemy, grant us so to die daily to sin, that we may evermore live with him in the joy of his risen life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Before our, our final hymn and prayer of blessing from our Bishop David, there are just one or two notices to draw your attention to. I thank you all for joining us for worship today. There is morning tea after the service, to which you're all invited to in the Cathedral Centre. I'll begin with a, a word of thanks, a word of thanks to all those who've worked so hard at the Cathedral Parish during this holy week in service preparation and delivery in the organization and particularly in the decoration of the cathedral this morning our thanks to you i'd like to thank all those who were involved in the children's fun zone on good friday morning and i hope you enjoy some of their creations at the back in the form of that easter garden i'd like to thank rachel and the choir for a week of staggeringly impressive music once again and the thanks to my brother and sister clergy for your hard work and extra hours this week and of course to Daryl and to Dilip and the serving team. I continue with announcements with regretfully a sad one for this joyous occasion. I have to share with you the news of the death of Major General Keith Birch, who passed away 
on a cruise as he was visiting Korea, where he served with distinction during the Korean War. Keith was a much loved and respected member of this cathedral family, a very decorated soldier, and who also was administrator or chapter clerk for York Minster in England when he retired from the military. So details of his funeral will be announced as they are known. And we hold his family in our prayers and pray that he will rest in peace and rise in glory. Next week, for those for whom it involves and affects, is the Cathedral Parish's annual general meeting. So please feel free to come back to the Cathedral next week if you'd like to join us for that. Our services next week, the pattern shifts slightly. We have a 9 a.m. service rather than an 8 and a 9.45, so a combined service. But I'm delighted to be able to say that Bishop Philip of Taranaki will be our president for the Eucharist, and Bishop Aries, Bishop of Kuching, our partner diocese, will be here as our preacher. Wednesday evening is our vestry meeting, and I commend to you the note about confirmation for 2013. And one final notice for which I need to change sides so I can address the congregation and Archbishop David and his family. Today is a, a defining moment in many ways for the cathedral. It is our last formal official service, our last Eucharist with Archbishop David as our Archbishop and Darson Bishop. Today is not the day for tributes and farewells because that is the task of next Saturday at St. Paul's Collegiate Chapel at 2 p.m. However, we did want to somehow mark this moment and how to do that appropriately was a challenge. We discussed together how we might do this to best effect. The last time I said goodbye to Bishop David was in 2004. And it was the other way around. I was going up to the Northern Hemisphere and he was remaining. Bishop David has been our bishop, your bishop, for 20 years. And I reflected in that 20 years, I've known eight Bishop Davids. I've served under eight bishops. And I can honestly say I've spent the last 10 years since leaving New Zealand wishing most of them were a bit more like you. You once said something, and I wish I had the Terea words for it, but I haven't. But your ministry truly is the flight of the white heron. I'd like to thank you on behalf of your cathedral family for 20 years of wisdom and courage, incredible integrity, humor, and for deep, costly araha that you've given all of us. You have been a gift to us all. We have a small personal gift. I'm going to ask Phil to present that. It's a very, very small token, but it comes with grateful gratitude from all of us, from our hearts. You will soon be a parishioner, and this cathedral will always be hopefully your hearth and your home. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, well, friends, it's a very poignant, um, mixed kind of emotion I think we all have in my family, because we aren't saying goodbye to you as a faith community. I'll be coming and going from Rome quite a lot, and we're going to be living just down below here in the parish, and we'll be here on some Sundays, and certainly Chureti and the rest of the family will be here from time to time when I'm not here. And that makes this faith community uh, the faith community I belong to the longest of any church. Uh, All Saints Palmas the North I did about 20, just under 20 years. This is just over 20 years and will be longer. Uh, and that makes you my family, my whanau. This makes this a Tūranga Waiwai a place to stand, a place to stand tall and to be part of the aroha of this, of this sacred hill and this sacred community. I can't say how much we have valued your consistent support. Often 
Kudeti is here when I'm flying off somewhere else. It's the one place we come back to for the kinds of things I was talking about in the, in the sermon. It's inclusive, it's hospitable, it's beautiful, it's joyful, it's honest. It's a wonderful Kiwi Anglican community. And uh, that will always be part of us and always sustain us. Uh, I can't say how impressed I am with the liturgy and the music of this place. Um, I've had a chance to hear the Vatican Choir last week. You are better. <laughs> um, and I think also the intimacy of this space and the way you fill it with your fellowship and your interest and your intelligence, your questions, your lives. Uh, in a way, I'm quite glad, in a way, they didn't fully complete the design they intended. Maybe we'll do it one day. But the design we intended for this cathedral after the First World War or before it was a very long, uh, narrow nave. And the way it kind of got sawn off in the Depression has kind of kept us close together, kind of kept the sanctuary and the nave and the chancel all kind of intimately bound up with each other. And that's, I think, been a wonderful thing about this, this sacred space. But thank you for everything. Thank you so much. And I can't say how pleased I am that you have uh, Peter is your dean. Uh, it's a wonderful note for me to end on uh, and to go on with the friendship you and I have enjoyed so much and with your family. But I won't name others because I would need all day. But uh, thank you so much for everything you mean to me and will continue to mean to Tureti and I and the Pano. Kia ora. Kia ora. I invite you now to please stand. One final act we decided we would like to do with the Archbishop's permission is to, is to pray for him. And so the clergy will come forward with me. We will lay our hands upon the Archbishop. And any of you who have known Archbishop David for these whole 20 years as part of the, the Cathedral Fano or beyond the walls of this Cathedral Parish, if you'd like to come forward as well and join in with us as we hold silence, pray our own prayers for him, his family, and all those who wait for him in Rome, and all those whom he farewells. Blessed are you, God our creator, God in history, God in revelation. Throughout the ages, your unchanging purpose has created a people to love and serve you. Blessed are you in Christ Jesus, your incarnation, our servant Lord, who by death overcame death. Through his resurrection and ascension through the gift of the Holy Spirit, you have given life in order to your church that we may carry out the ministry of love. We thank you for calling this your servant David to share his ministry amongst us. As deacon, priest, bishop, archbishop, and now director of the Anglican, Anglican Center in Rome and envoy to the Vatican for the Archbishop of Canterbury. God of grace, through your Holy Spirit, gentle as a dove, living, burning as fire, empower your servant David for this new adventure of faith. We pray for him. We pray for his Fano.
May every grace of ministry rest on this your servant David. Keep him strong and faithful. Protect him in your love. Keep him steadfast in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Let us now sing and stand as we sing the great hymn of Easter, Thine be the glory. God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, make you perfect in every good work, to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go now to love and serve the Lord. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.